How often should I take photos for my long-term time-lapse? One of the most common questions we get at Photo Sentinel is how often should I take photos for my long-term time-lapse? And there's actually a whole raft of considerations you need to take in when making that decision. It can sound complex, but in this video, we're gonna break it down for you step by step so that by the end, you can work out what interval you need for your project. The key is to understand which service you're providing to the end client. Is it just a one-time long-term time-lapse video at the end of the project? Or is it the monitoring value, the real-time information that they're valuing? Now, if you're only pitching the long-term time-lapse video and not the monitoring, then you're missing a lot out on a lot of the value to the end client and you can also charge accordingly. So we definitely would recommend that you check out our pitching video if this is the case for you. Shooting to get photos for a time lapse at the end of the project requires different things from shooting primarily for monitoring services. But as we said, most often you're doing both. And so we're gonna look at each of those scenarios individually and then we're gonna bring them together and show what sort of shooting regime and uploading regime are gonna be best to hit both of those targets. So first up, let's look at how you need to shoot in order to get all the photos you need for your final long-term time-lapse video. Now the key here is to think about what change are you documenting. It's easy if you come from a short-term time-lapse background to think that faster is better, it creates smoother video. But ask yourself, what change am I documenting in this long-term time-lapse? Is it people moving around on site and machines and bulldozers tracking around the site? Or is the main subject the structure that's being constructed and therefore the change happens a lot more slowly? There may be no change minute to minute, hour to hour, even day to day. It's happening a lot more slowly. And so your requirement for shooting lots of photos actually drops down because you're trying to capture the change over time. Now there are some times on construction sites where lots of change happens very quickly. And in those times, you're going to want to set a different interval. Say when there's a concrete pour or a crane is bringing some large prefabricated elements onto the construction site, those times you might change your interval to be something closer to what you would shoot for a normal short-term time-lapse. You want to get people moving around on site, the crane dropping in those prefab units, uh, the concrete being poured. And so for long-term time-lapse, what you actually end up with is two different sets of intervals. One interval that you're using for 95% of the project, capturing the change in the structure that's being built, change that is happening very slowly. And then a faster interval for those unique events, 5% of the time, where change is happening much faster. And in that way, you're capturing both the sets of change across your long-term time-lapse project. Secondly, for long-term time-lapse, is the principle of overshooting. So it would be a mistake to think, I need a two minute video at the end, 30 frames a second, that's 3,600 photos, and I'm gonna distribute those photos evenly across the life of the project. And the reason that would be a mistake is because with long-term time-lapse, you're going to end up with a whole raft of photos you can't use. Say the electricians are working inside the building for two weeks, there's no change happening on the outside of the building. You get a week of rain where nothing happens on the construction site. The workers go on strike for a week. In winter, the first half of the day is filled with fog, you can't use those photos. In winter, the sun's a bit lower and it's shining into your lens in some photos. In winter, the days are shorter and so you lose some of your photos at the start and the end of the day because the lighting conditions have changed. And then if you're unlucky, a spider builds a web across the window and so until you can go out and clean it off, you can't use those photos. So for all these reasons and more, you're going to end up with a whole raft of photos that you can't use. By way of example, I edited a long-term time-lapse. I had about four minutes of footage and after I'd cut out all the photos I couldn't or didn't want to use, it ended up in about a 30 second video. So that's eight times as many photos were taken as I ended up using. So you always need to overshoot for long-term time-lapse. Now this principle of overshooting is countered by some of the restrictions that long-term time-lapse inherently has. For example, data usage. How much data are you or your client willing to pay for? Are you gonna upload every single photo? If you are, you may not be able to take them as fast as you would like. Secondly, power restrictions. Does the site have AC? If it does, you can probably run the camera as fast as you want, but if it doesn't, you're gonna be restricted by solar and by the battery that the system has. And then thirdly, your post-production capabilities, both in terms of your time and your computing power. If you end up with hundreds of thousands of photos, where are you gonna store them? How are you gonna process them? How are you gonna have the time to go through every single photo and work out what you wanna use? So taking those considerations in balance with the principle of overshooting, 
we found over time that probably a photo every 10 to 30 minutes is about what works best. Now, of course, the other factor playing into all this is the client's expectations. How often are they wanting a photo to be taken? Sometimes you might have a client that wants to take a photo very often, and the key is to understand why, why that is. And after you understand the why, perhaps maybe shooting a photo every 10 minutes meets their requirements. Now, in rarer circumstances, shooting every faster than that is required. And so you need to talk them through the power requirements, the data costs associated with making that happen for their project. Now, another important consideration for the intervals of long-term time lapse is understanding the project monitoring value to the end client. Um, you'll oftentimes take and upload a lot more photos for the project monitoring than you would for the actual, that you'll need for the actual long-term time lapse. So it's important to understand the why of the project monitoring that the end client desires. Is it the subcontractors seeing them on site? Is it understanding the change that's happening, seeing all of the cranes that are on site? You need to understand exactly what they need to be able to determine the interval for the project. For many projects, of course, you're going to be providing both those services, the ongoing monitoring and the long-term time lapse video at the end of the project. So let me talk for a moment about the options that the Photo Sentinel Mark II gives you that'll help with your workflow to fulfill both of those with the one piece of equipment. The first way the Mark II system helps with this is by having significant onboard storage so that you don't have to upload every photo. What you can also do is you can split out RAW and JPEG. So you can set the system to just upload JPEG for your monitoring. You can upload smaller files and save RAW locally on the external hard drive that comes with the system. Now, it does mean you have to go out and manually collect those raw files, but it's a pretty big storage drive, so you don't have to do it all that often. Now, there are other systems out on the market that actually don't have significant onboard storage, so if you're not using Photo Sentinel, but you do want to shoot raw and save it locally, make sure you check that it has a large onboard storage capacity. Also with Photo Sentinel, you don't have to upload every photo that's taken. So you could shoot a photo every 10 minutes, but for reasons of data requirements or your client's expectations, you're only uploading one per hour. Again, you're gonna to have to go out there and manually collect those other photos, but it does keep your data costs down, means you're still meeting the client's requirement if they only need a photo every hour, but you're still meeting your requirement for what you need for the end time that's video by shooting more frequently. So in summary, you need to be thinking about the change you're documenting alongside the client's expectations with regards to the project monitoring service. The one detailed calculation you're going to need to get into the nitty gritty of is your data usage because you don't want to blow out and have not budgeted for terabytes of data upload and suddenly find you've eaten into all your costs. So we've got another video that goes step by step through how to calculate your data usage and what to consider. So make sure you check that out.